Throughout my journey of learning traditional basket weaving, I've found that the stories of Appalachian elders are vital as a source of inspiration for personal and community resiliency. Will you tell us your name, your full name? Cecil Ellsworth Tabler. And what year were you born? 1934. So that makes you how old? Makes me 87. And where were you born? In a log cabin on Haggy Ridge around close to Kilvert here. How many siblings did you have? It was 14 of us all together. Of course, we wasn't all home at the same time, you know. When we lived in that log cabin, we was probably eight of us at home, you know. My dad was working for the WPA. It was some outfit that you work and get groceries, you know. And then we was on welfare all the rest of the time. Sometimes we'd go for a week without eating. That was miserable. Thought about uh, going and getting a job somewhere, you know. How old were you when you thought about doing that? Uh, Fifteen. At that age, my uh, brother got killed down there on the railroad track. He was 23. So after that, I went to Columbus and just got different jobs, mowing grass. And I would sit down to Union Hall and wait on jobs to come in. 16 years old, you know, when jobs come in, it's something I didn't want, I'd take. And how did you start with the company? What was it called, Unisource? Yeah, it was Copco Papers at first. And I delivered big rolls of paper to different big presses printing presses and stuff. And they seen I was trying, so they just kept kept promoting me. And that's where I stayed till I retired. Did you put away for retirement? No, they put away for me. Not out of your check, they put it in by themselves, you know. And I had a good wife. When I married her, we moved to Columbus and got an apartment, and then I bought a farm down here and 185 acres. I just wanted to be home, I reckon. Where did you like living better, the city or the country? Well, I like the country the best. What do you like about the country? Free freedom, free. <laughs> I think we had a sign at Tabletown. That means your family had been here for over 100 years. Oh, yeah. By the time you were born. Yep. This is my dad. That's his brother. That's my grandpa and grandma. Okay. Julie Goins and Adam Tabler. There's a half sister right there. And what's her name? Nan. She was the woman who took care of the babies and stuff. She's she the was the midwife. Midwife. And how do you think she learned how to be a midwife? Just by experience, started to cut navel strings. <laughs> Mom never had a doctor when she was uh, having kids, just midwife. Then the doctor would come in after and check her, you know, when he got time. Will you tell us your name? Geraldine Tabler. What was your maiden name? Harris. You don't believe you have a nickname? Tootsie. <laughs> this is your Irish grandmother, yes. your maternal grandmother, uh -huh. and your mom. Right. There's my mom, and there's my dad. He's peeking. We were colored. We wasn't white. We was colored. And if Grandma was here, she'd sit you down that chair and tell you who you are. <laughs> she would say, you're black, you're white, and you're Native American. And that's me. Look at my hair. That's Barbara. We are the two people of color. We was just in our own little worlds. When I was a child, we didn't, the rest of the world really didn't matter. I mean, that's the way we was brought up, because everything was segregated then, you know. And actually, when the school burned, we went to store, it was the first time that I ever been out of there, except when we went with mom and them to Athens or somewhere like that. So the Tabletown School was 
A one-room schoolhouse? Mm -hmm. We got all the old stuff they threw away from the store. And we'd have two weeks where we would amend books. Then we would have to share books and stuff like that. And you don't really think about the differences until when we went to school. It was a big surprise, you know. There's more to the world than this. The changing classes was the hardest because we're used to sitting in one, you know, eight grades in one room, and now you have to change classes. That was very confusing. The bell would ring, you had to be somewhere, and, but nobody really helped you, you know, because they was as uncertain about us as we was about them. I think the kids that were on the bus were sh as about as shocked as we were, but this red-headed girl in the back of the bus, she waved her hand for me to come and sit with her. And her name was Mary James, and she was my best friend all through. This is my certificate of marriage. Where did you get married? At Ike Kennedy's house in Cutler. Did you have a big wedding? No. I, my dad signed a paper in the morning. He went to work, and I, I went home with my mother-in-law. <laughs> we got married in this front room here. And my sister-in-law and my mom was witnesses. Daddy said he wasn't missing a day's work. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Your only daughter. <laughs> Where'd you get married at? Right up here along the road, Caneville. Did you go to like a courthouse or? Go to a man's house, preacher. Did you have a party or anything? Hell no. Why don't you say your full name and give us your birth date? Charles Franklin Bond, 11 So that makes you how old today? 87. And where were you born? Deep Holler. Where is Deep Holler? That's out of Frost, right next to Coolville. I spent two thirds of my life in the woods, walked thousands of miles, but I'm still here. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to cry to get my dad to take me coon hunting, and he was working all the time, and I really wanted to go. Couldn't go by myself, wasn't big enough. I remember the first thing I caught was a rabbit. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to get in the trap, but he did. Did you used to sleep out in the woods? Yeah. I'd cut timber all day and go back here over the hill and lay down and go to sleep. And the dogs, maybe three an hour later, way across the hill, or wake up and go. I learned how coons go and what paths they make what holes they go into, what then trees they are. Who taught you all that? How'd you teach yourself? By doing it. I come up out of the holler with 12 one night. How much did they sell for then? $22 each. The next year, I was gonna to try to catch 50 coons and 50 foxes. I caught 49 foxes and a coyote and 108 coons. I was out there after him. Did you get paid in cash? Yeah. And then what'd you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Lived. We couldn't afford a gun, so we'd go out in the field and find groundhogs and take barbed wire and stick back in a hole and wind it around their skin and drag them out, knock them in the head, and put them in the pot. Gerald, it was up a tree and down by the garden, and he, I had never cooked a groundhog before, so I fried it, and it was real good, but it made my pot stink. And I said, I'm not doing that anymore. So every time he'd get one, he'd take it to his sister on which she could really cook it. And they ate a lot of that, too. People ate coons back then. Did you eat them? I've ate them. You roast a big old coon, put potatoes and turnips and Carrots around him, they ate as good as anything. What was your favorite meat to eat as a kid? 
Probably squirrel. Squirrel and sweet potatoes and gravy is good eating. Did you guys have a garden? Did you grow the sweet yes. potatoes? Grew everything. Had chickens and pigs. You had to have. My dad had some old goats out there. We'd uh, chop our heads off and eat them, which I didn't like, but I was, I liked to meat. We had to fight off hawks. They would sweep down and, and get the little chickens. I remember a damn hawk flew over and grabbed a chicken up there and we made so much noise and raised hell it dropped the chicken. You had to keep what you had. Couldn't let a warmer to eat it. There are many parallels between the challenges our elders face and what we are experiencing today. They found the strength and resources needed to survive and succeed. Their insight is a gift that shows us how to persist in times of adversity. This is milkweed. My wife used to pick. Would she get it when it was like leafed out like this or before the leaves got so big? Well, it was about like this. She cut it all the way to the ground? Yeah, and used stems. Did you eat poke in the spring? My mother did, but I didn't. She'd get dandelions, watercress, milkweed. She had to have it every spring, as soon as them dandelions come up. My mother-in-law, she could pick greens and, you know, they shrink. You got to have a lot of them. And she would have so many different kinds in there, and they were good. But I've seen some people that they don't know how to do it. It makes them bitter. Now, how long is it going to take you to make enough of them to make a basket? Too long. You have to just do it while you're hanging out with your friends or listening to a story so you don't think about it. <laughs> we tried to dig a skunk out one time. You think that wasn't the episode? <laughs> how long did you smell like a skunk after that? Quite a while. Now, what'd you use to get rid of the skunk smell? Just let it wear off. I like to smell skunk. What did they use skunk lard for? Skunk grease. Mom would make when us kids got sick. She, we never knew about a doctor or nothing. She'd make poultices and put over her breast when we got bad colds and stuff. With skunk grease and it was stinking stuff. <laughs> but it would bring a cold out of you. Colds, aches. They use it for everything. I hear fussing about Vic Sav and all that stuff. I thought they haven't smelled anything. <laughs> but it worked. My mom had some on the stove. We ran her out and we come home from school and started eating it. You just ate the skunk grease? Skunk. You ate the skunk? Yeah. The meat? Yeah. How was it? Good. <laughs> skunk number one. <laughs> it's great to be alive, ain't it? <laughs> What about snake root? Yes, they, they took the root and boiled it, and that was for colds, too. That in uh, bone set. I was telling you about the coarse salt. Mm -hmm. Mom used to put it in a sock or something and lay it in a pie pan on the back of the cold stove and heat it. If you've had, like, infection in your tooth, that salt, like, draw the uh, stuff out. Do you use yellow root for anything? It's good for sore throat. It's good for your stomach. It's good for cold sores and that kind of stuff, but it's the bitter stuff you ever put in your mouth. They use poultices, like you mash the stuff up and put it in something, then put it on your sore. Because they didn't have, even like the doctors, you know, they had their own little rooms where they went and mixed the stuff, and when you left, you had it, and two or three things cured everything. But see, these old people died off and took the secret with them. <laughs> For two or three years, I dug may apple roots. You got to dry them first, and it took a lot of may apple to make a pound. And I'd take them to store it and sell them. We started out digging may apple. Then we got to hunting ginseng, yellow root. You dig a snake root whenever you see one. I wasn't too much interested in yellow root. What were you interested in? Ginseng. Why was that? Well, cause it was worth more. I even dream of finding big ginseng patches. Still to this day? Yeah. 
pull them out of there, that big as sweet potatoes. Keep, keep digging them, digging them. Wake up. You ever found a ginseng root as big as a sweet potato? No. What do the leaves look like? Five little palms? Yeah. Three big ones and two little ones. On each prong, they come up and one prong, two prong, three prong, four prong. Then four prongs from then on. Do they come up every year? No. Do you harvest it when it has berries on it? Yeah. And then do you put the seeds back down? Yeah. What's it feel like when you see ginseng? I don't know, just a good feeling. When you come out of the woods with all your pockets full, knowing what you've got, knowing somebody else didn't do it for you. Cecil, would you consider yourself successful? Yeah, I had a rough way to go at it, though. For being successful as I am, to own my own place and, you know, no more than I had. But I just kept hammering away. The hard times was the best times, actually. Why? I don't know. Just the way it is. What did you get out of living like that? A life. Well, you didn't know you was bad off hell. You were surviving just like everybody else was. What advice do you have for youth? Get rid of the phones. What do you think it's doing to us? I don't think it's doing anything for you. Oh my gosh, this is really beautiful. I think nowadays we don't really listen to one another. I think back there people probably didn't have a choice because they were in one area, they didn't travel, they didn't, so they were actually interacting with each other at all times, and now we're so busy, we just kind of jump here and there. And even when we're listening sometimes, we don't hear. I made you something. Do you know what it is? Well, I felt it. What is it? It feels like a basket. Yeah. <laughs> you notice I have baskets sitting around with everything in it. Oh, that's so pretty. So I'm not sure if you ever saw a basket like that. No. But it's white oak and honeysuckle. Oh my goodness. First I thought it was a grapevine. That's what I went when I looked at it. I wanna know if you've ever seen a basket like that. No. Do you know what this is? Hickory bark? Poplar bark. Poplar bark. You know what this is? Deer tail. This is like the whole spine. And I sewed this all together with deer rawhide, so deer skin. And this is a piece of white oak bark. They call them Appalachian berry buckets. A berry bucket? I was thinking you might be able to put your roots in it. Yeah. Turn around. How's that feel? All right. So just had it full of ginseng, you feel better. A basket. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. What do you think? It's a nice one. What's your advice for future generations and school kids? Just keep trying. That's all I could say. Do you think they should move away from here? I don't know if it calls for that. You know. But if they can find a good job at home, they're blessed. When I was just a boy, days of childhood, I used to play till evening shadows come. Then winding down an old familiar pathway, I heard my mother call that set of songs. visions now I see her standing yonder her familiar voice I hear once more it's a supper time in heaven and now I know she's waiting for me there come home 
come home at supper time. The shadows link, they ain't fast. Come home, come home at supper time. We're gone.